Kristen Hamilton is a multi-time founder, CEO with an IPO exit, and now board director at Top Hat. She is a Seattle-based C100 charter member, originally hailing from Quebec. Today, Kristen is a senior strategist at Entangled Group, which is a venture studio dedicated to the education ecosystem. Kristen has spent a career disrupting education at startups and large corporations, having led global educator strategy for Microsoft and leading as Chief Operating Officer of World Learning, a global education and development organization. We've invited Kristen to lead our discussion today for what I hope is obvious reasons from what I've just mentioned with Mike, Martin, and Brian, and she'll introduce them or have them introduce themselves in more detail. At a high level though, I'll just tell you who we've assembled today. Mike Siligadze is the co-founder and CEO of Top Hat, a leading higher education platform in the US and Canada. Mike is also a C100 member. Martin Basiri is the co-founder and CEO of ApplyBoard, an online platform that helps international students gain access to higher ed in the US, Canada, and the UK. ApplyBoard is EdTech's latest unicorn. Uh, and we are so proud that Martin also uh, came to C100's 48 Hours in the Valley program back when, before his Series A a few years ago. Brian Frank is the Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science at Queen's University. Any Queen's alumni, please feel free to mention yourself in the chat and thank Brian for his support. For now, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to lead us in conversation. Thank you so thank much, Laura. Laura. And yeah. thank you thank very you much, sure. everyone, for being here. And uh, it's uh, very hard, hard to be able to have this conversation and discussion. Um, and also so proud to be in such good company with Brian, Martin, and Mike. So we're gonna keep this kind of fast paced. Uh, we got a couple of interesting and exciting, I think maybe even controversial topics to jump into. Um, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is I'm gonna invite each of the panelists to, to, to introduce themselves in the context of a, a question. So um, all of us have been engaged in some form of education um, for a long time. And we are now in this moment in time, brought on by the current circumstances that Laura described. Um, but there's also this been this long history of work in higher education and higher education innovation that we should honor. Um, the question I have is like, is this the gradually then suddenly moment of disruption for higher education? So things have been gradual in many ways and now that it could happen suddenly. So I wanna give each panelist an opportunity to wax poetic on what the future holds, uh, really briefly to say, what's your perspective on what will happen in the fall and beyond. So, you know, dive into what's different, what will be different um, in the fall, of course, but and beyond. Uh, what's your perspective on that um, in general in any way you wanna, uh, wanna talk about that. And when you do introduce yourselves, just say your name, your alma mater, again, even though we sort of got it. Uh, and um, uh, perhaps a new habit you have started since COVID. So I'll go first, Kristen Hamilton, Ivy alum from University of Western Ontario, proud alum. Um, and uh, a new habit I've started since COVID has been that I dive into cold water every morning and do a cold plunge uh, to wake myself up. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it to Brian to introduce himself, um, his alma mater, his new habit, and then what do you think the immediate and long-term future holds given this gradual and then sudden moment in change? Brian. All right. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, so Brian Frank, um, I'm a proud alum of Queens, uh, actually for all of my degrees. And I've been at Queens in some form, uh, going back to sometime in the 90s. I'll leave that somewhat vague. Um, the new habit that I have formed is a tradition with my family where we have a family games night. Um, typically, that doesn't work for us if we've got kids all over with different sporting activities. Lately, though, the, the family games night has become a new tradition in my family. Um, I think along the lines of what Kristen said, uh, there of course have been uh, incremental changes in higher ed, especially over the past 10 years. We've been seeing increasing use of educational technology, um, more presence of online, blended learning, uh, increased exposure and emphasis on experiential learning. Um, I think this is going to see a significant change in what happens, partly because of forced experimentation. 
Uh, we've been listening to students about their experience of what happened in the spring. Uh, we recognize a lot of challenges associated with, you know, many of, we're all facing challenges in this current situation, but the number of instructors who are having conversations, working with specialists, um, and seriously thinking, you know, how do we use technology to deliver programming um, in the, the current environment, I think is going to help us learn how we could do things more in the future. So um, even though this is a very unfortunate situation, I think we are certainly trying to use it as a learning opportunity with higher ed. Never waste a, a crisis, as they say. Uh, great, I love it. Okay, Martin, let's, let's go to you next. Hi everyone, I'm Martin Basiri. I start with a habit. I'm taking uh, a lot of vitamin D and I also do biking. Um, I read a lot that vitamin D could be, have a good correlation with what is happening. And also I'm an immigrant to North America. So I'm not getting as much sun as I should get. So I'm supplementing this vitamin D and, um, and biking. Um, what we do, we help uh, schools across North America and United Kingdom to um, find and recruit the best international students. And on the other side, we help uh, students from all over the world to find the best um, universities or colleges that match their needs. Um, what, is, um, what is happening for this fall, a lot of it is like basically we have to see, um, it, it was like a short amount of a time of a decrease, but then a very rapid uh, growth back in the application. And it seems like the 18 year olds that they had a plan to go to college, they're not changing their plan and they're okay to start a portion of it online. And that's very, very uh, beautiful, um, beautiful and interesting thing to be, to be seen that how they're adaptable. And on the other side, I was very also interested to see how universities adopted very fast. Almost 40% of the programs within four months, they turned to be online or some sort of online. We have to like see was a um, class satisfaction of them and data comes out of it. But this too was very interesting that both the students and educators, they forced themselves to adopt. And as Brian said, that will be a new era of openness, especially from a higher education to doing things new and opportunity for education companies uh, in, and education technology companies to take a piece of the pie. Right on, super interesting to see that you're still managing to create connections with international students despite travel challenges and I'm really excited about that. Um, Mike, uh, you're up next. Let's hear from you. All right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I'm Mike, founder and CEO of Top Hat. Uh, I'm a University of Waterloo grad. Uh, and um, yeah, new habit is mostly staying home. I'm, I'm doing a lot more of that than uh, I ever have before. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess the, the, the interesting new thing I'm doing weirdly is exercising a lot more. I wouldn't have thought that being home uh, 24 seven for weeks on end would actually uh, have me exercise more, but I think that's kind of how I'm trying to keep my, uh, my sanity. Um, so first of all, I mean, just very quickly, what is Top Hat? Top Hat is an active learning platform. We fundamentally have an entire technology tool suite that helps universities and faculty members create active learning experiences in a traditional or an online uh, uh, teaching setting. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't be, uh, frankly, better positioned to to be able to help folks out uh, during this crisis. We're really excited to be uh, to be doing so. Um, you know, universities are going to be facing a challenge. And the fundamental uh, element of that challenge is around the fact that the playing field has been leveled. It's been leveled between traditional universities and a lot of online alternatives. And so students are going to be asking themselves a question, should I be paying 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year for Zoom lectures? And I think even though many students, uh, as Martin mentioned, especially the ones that are first entering university, you know, they had a plan in mind, we're seeing data to suggest that majority, 80, 90% are continuing on that path. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's being balanced out. I think universities are going to be put to the test this fall. 
Um, and if the experience that they provide is basically a replica of the traditional sage on the stage model, except now delivered via Zoom, uh, there will be consequences. I think it'll be disastrous. And I think we're gonna see universities uh, uh, seeing a lot of uh, uh, pushback and an extreme negative reaction if that's, if that's the, the, the extent to which they, uh, they transition. I think fundamentally the differentiation that universities now need to focus on is on the quality of the learning experience that they provide to their students. And what it's doing really is accelerating, dramatically accelerating the changes that were already happening, that were already in place uh, you know, over the prior several years, many years, uh, and compressing the next 10 years of changes into the next uh, uh, six months to, to 12 months. And what we're gonna see is an outcome uh, that's sort of bifurcated between universities that took this opportunity to dramatically change their delivery model to embrace technology to create a differentiated active learning experience uh, for their students versus schools that you know hand their professors a zoom license and uh, uh, hope for the best uh, so i think this creates a tremendous opportunity for uh technology companies in the education space uh you know like uh, like top hat like apply board like like many others uh to work with their universities work with their partners to be able to help them navigate this crisis and come out of it on the on the right side of that uh, of that bifurcation that's going to happen very cool it's i think a big challenge for large organizations of any type to suddenly have to innovate and um it does require a lot of courage and we're seeing a lot of that courage actually which is very uh, exciting i want to focus for a minute on the student um completely on the student and we've all in, you know, had an experience of being a student, um, probably on this call, whether that's in K-12 or, or, or in higher education. Um, and so uh, that brought us certain things as human beings, as um, you know, professionals and so forth. And if you look back in the rearview mirror, you think, oh, it was because of this experience, perhaps it wasn't necessarily sitting in a class or even listening to a lecture, but the whole experience of being a student. Um, but the learning piece is a big part of it, of course. So how, is the student experience going to be impacted by this, uh, this, this new normal that we're moving towards? Canadian universities largely have said the fall we're going to be completely online. It's a mix in the US and people believe that as we get closer to fall in the US, it'll be much more people hybrid or you know, not back to the way it was, more online. Um, so it means a lot of things for students. Um, I'd like to, to dive in first with Brian, who uh, sits alongside students for most of his days in a normal situation and probably has quite a lot of contact with students on an ongoing basis. Um, can you comment, Brian, first of all, on what do you think is going to be the new normal for students? How's it going to impact students? What are some of the maybe pros and cons and how do we how do we think about that? What this potential impact is on society with students having a different kind of experience in university? Yeah, you're right. There's there's no question. This is going to be a different kind of experience. Uh, even within Canada, there are, I, I don't think we're going to see everything fully online. Uh, as you see, what's happening with health guidelines across the country, there will certainly be places that are doing some things online. Um, or sorry, in, in person, in addition to online. Uh, there's a lot of activity as we're talking to students, listening to students, having conversations between the universities. Uh, we're talking about how do we provide opportunity for students to do design activities. So you're still having a chance to build things and implement things and test things. Uh, complex problem solving, having students work in groups and teams. Sometimes that's going to involve students doing so virtually. Uh, it's small Zoom discussion groups. Um, we've been having discussions at my institution about how we do design projects with students in different locations, building their own artifacts and then doing testing using CAD tools and combining it. Um, so there's no question, some of the value of the residential experience is gonna be, let's say temporarily suspended for students. Um, you know, just like many things we're gonna have to. Uh, but I, I think there is still going to be a, a recognition of the importance of students doing activities, especially in the, the engineering and high tech sector. Uh, and I think as we're designing this, we're also being really careful to think about potential inequities between the students. If we assume that every student has a high speed internet connection and can connect at any moment of the day with a high quality computer, that's not always possible. So I think institutions do need to be very careful to think about how do we make sure that we're providing both a good learning experience, experiential hands-on learning, 
opportunity for group collaboration and also acknowledging um, that there are some inequities and in the, the access students have to all these tools. Yeah, that's a great point. And then, you know, the collaborative aspect of learning has become, it has always been important. And I think the recognition of that collaboration, learning how to do that in school so that you know how to do that in the world has been really critical. Mike, you at Top Hat have actually launched some new products rapidly, speaking of innovation, to address this as sort of a need for projects to be done remotely. Um, you also did a student survey that was really broad to hear, like to actually get a pulse for how our students feeling right now. So what do you think about this, this point? Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Uh, we, we, you know, we have tens of thousands of faculty uh, courses that are running on Top Hat. And we got to observe this in many ways firsthand, uh, how people handled this transition, this very rapid transition to online. And now we're getting to observe how people are planning uh, their, their courses for the, for the fall. And so it's been fascinating to watch um, in sort of the broader ecosystem, uh, not just not the Top Hat users, but in the broader ecosystem, uh, what we've seen is interesting trends where students are finding that sense of community that they previously got from an on-campus experience through various online tools. Um, and what, one of the things, I guess, to, to what you're mentioning, Kristen, is we launched uh, uh, Slate, which is basically a community chat platform baked into Top Hat, um, and seeing professors, faculty leverage that to replace some of that face-to-face -face interaction they previously had, including hosting virtual office hours, hosting breakout groups, and, and things like that. Uh, so just uh, there's been a tremendous reliance on technology uh, in, in a very rapid pace of adoption, you know, hundreds of times faster than we've seen uh, we've seen before, uh, and that's been that's been interesting to see. The question is, you know, will there be will that be sufficient uh, in order to replace that uh, that on campus experience? Um, uh, and I think the answer is no, which is why pro probably many schools are going towards a hybrid model, which is I think fundamentally the right one, where you get some of that on campus in person experience. But uh, the, uh, the uh, large courses and, and, and some of that group work activity needs to be now handled in online uh, setting through, uh, through technology tools. What I really hope doesn't happen, I mean, this is what we saw certainly in the secondary space and even in, in post-secondary, we saw that in certain schools, uh, is large groups of students just flat out opting out. I mean, I think that is the worst case Armageddon scenario for many universities is uh, you know, with the, the spring semester, you had, I think it was 30 or 40% of students just flat out stopped attending classes online, stopped engaging, everything went pass fail and everybody basically got a pass. If we see that happening this, uh, this fall, I'm, I'm terrified, frankly. I mean, our fate is very much intertwined with the success of uh, higher education. So we have a very vested interest in uh, making sure universities are successfully engaging their their students. Um, so my hope is that technology can fill that gap, uh, that void that uh, uh, that on campus experience uh, is going to leave. Yep, and I think that's that's uh, the big challenge, which is why it's exciting to know that there are companies like um, Apply Board and, and Top Hat that are that are have been working on this for a long time to dump in right now. Martin, I want to jump in on uh, the student experience, especially from an international student point of view. I've been looking at data that shows that international student populations have, for the first time, flattened in decline in the U.S. due to the immigration changes in the United States. And Canada has been the beneficiary of that and looking at the data. So that means that a lot of these scientists and engineers from places like Iran and other countries are uh, coming to the to Canada. To me, that's a really exciting trend for the long term uh, potential of Canadian technology and innovation and actually the economy. So what are you seeing from a student point of view, from an inter international student point of view, be it studying abroad from Canada or the United States or the other way, you know, inbound international students? And how has this reality impacted their experience? Yeah. So international students market is like a water on a table. When you raise it from one side, the water moves from one side to another side. And the countries are the pillar of this table. So if United States makes it harder, what happened, the flood go to Canada, Australia, UK, and now the new players like China, Germany, France, Spain, Japan, everyone want international students because international students bring diversity to campus. We people, part of the experience that we go to a college and we pay $30,000 is to learn how to the soft skills, beside the hard skills that we need to learn for, for example, be a coder. We want to learn how to do teamwork. We want to learn how to love other people. 
We want to learn how to communicate with compassion. See what is happening right now in the United States is one of the testaments that if our people, even at the earliest stage, they get exposed to diversity, a lot of these problems won't happen. And data completely show that. More you make people isolated and just being in one group, there is a problem. So the students of today, they want international, international experience, not only on their campus in UK or Canada as a domestic student, but also a lot of them, they want to go to other countries and also experience living abroad and having experience in another set of universities and friends. What we see from the international students, it was extremely well handled by the students. And another testament, it was, I was very surprised because the people who decide to go abroad for studies at the age of 20, 18, 22, these are the like more independent taught and mature people. And the way that they handled it, like we looked at how our customer like saying they're sad or happy, how, how did the ratio change? And we see extremely well handled by that group of students. And I'm very proud to see something in the international students. But as Mike said, they right now looking for substitute of experience. If they cannot go to that beautiful gym that university created, they're looking for another experience. And that experience could be, let me just teach you this additional skill. Let me teach you how you're gonna find job four years down the road when you're graduating. Let me teach you how to handle a stress in your life. Let me teach you how to do a financial management in your life. So if something like this happened, you don't have to go become a homeless. Universities must substitute those experiences. So me as a student feel I'm getting the value. And these days is a supply demand. If I cannot get the value, I'm not gonna pay for it, especially for higher education that every single year, the tuition fee has rised, is a high ticket price. A lot of people literally till the age of 40s are dealing with paying out the debt. People want a unique experience. I think we are shifting to the economy of experience in higher education. It is no brainer. Schools must serve their students in another level and go beyond it, or their competition for the same number of students would have some of them left beyond. Well, one of the, the areas of disruption and that's been controversial that you just touched on is the engagement of employers in education. And there are, are lots of points of view on that, you know, uh, historically sort of pushback for good reason and also embracing it for good reason. But, you know, Waterloo famously has embraced um, as a Canadian university that's embraced connection with employers from the beginning with their co-op model, which is world renowned. Um, and now Scott Galloway famously recently wrote a, an article that was widely distributed about how he believes that sort of there will be these corporatized universities. Uh, in Brazil, banks have started universities many, many for a long time and said, I need talent and I need it for I'm going to start a university. It's going to be called my bank's name university. Um, so uh, this, this creates an opportunity for applied learning, but it also poses challenges with, you know, what if corporations decide on curriculum, et cetera. So, um, where do where do we Brian I want to dive in with you on that a little bit like how from a, an institutional standpoint how do you think about that the involvement of employers uh, imagine tech companies and uh, you know large corporations being much more involved and and their fingers all over the uh, higher education um, you know curriculum business everything how, how do you how do you think about that what do you what do you think about that from the inside I think there's a couple of very valuable roles that um, industry plays, you know, particularly in professional programs, engineering, particularly being mine. Um, we, uh, Waterloo's been used as a great example of one that's had long-term partnerships that reaches out. Um, this is something that is growing strength at Queens, of course, Sharon Yousefi, um, through the C100, this is his, been his primary role. Uh, I think there is some, um, some necessary caution in that um, the purpose of general higher ed is 
to to support and promote um, you know long term learning you know preparing for an entire career and I think there are particular elements where industry assists both in educational technology and of course I think we got some great examples here where it can have a significant beneficiary role in higher ed um, I think there we do want to make sure that we're not preparing students for uh, just the job of next year or the year after because things change so rapidly. Uh, that's, I think, the role of focusing on some of the things that I think Martin was talking around, some of those uh, professional or, or power skills, you know, strong communication, strong critical thinking, uh, strong problem solving, uh, understanding of equity, uh, thinking about the, the power of diversity, uh, and including within that some of the, the critical um, technical skills. Uh, that are needed right now, but having that, that base of professional skill and ability to learn on your own that will enable you to adapt five, ten years as things change. So I see roles both in, in partnership um, on the technology side and delivering uh, and also power in, um, in, in collaboration to ensure that students have both the short term and the long term skills. Yep. And Mike, I'm going to give you the last word here before we go to the question um, from, from the audience. The degree, whether the degree is even meaningful to employers in the long run is coming to question where you think about like skills versus certificates and degrees. Um, what's your perspective on on that and, and in terms of the, the engagement of employers and the role they can play? Yeah, and I, I guess I'll, I'll answer that maybe by echoing what both Brian and, and Martin said. Um, I 100% agree, and this is not me speaking as a, as a top hatter. Uh, uh, but speaking just as a, a citizen, I guess, uh, um, I really believe that education has a much broader and more essential role uh, than just preparing people for jobs. I mean, that I don't think that was ever the intent of university. I mean, if you go back 100, 200 years, uh, nobody was talking about, oh, I'm going to get that university degree so I can go get a job. Um, it's fundamentally, I think, an essential part of a thriving and educated, uh, creating a thriving and educated populace that can elect the right leaders, they can have, uh, you know, civic uh, uh, participation. So there's much more to it than, uh, than just learning, uh, you know, a particular trade skill. Uh, that, that's really the difference between trade schools and, and universities. So I think that, uh, and, and this is going back to what Martin said, that that connection of community is so absolutely critical. I mean, that's really fundamentally what, uh, 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 what is at risk, I guess, with this transformation that's happening within education, in particular this, this coming year. Uh, is it's absolutely essential that universities are able to uh, maintain that sense of connection and community, uh, you know, within students, uh, student groups, uh, so that they see that value and, and develop those those um, uh, skills that are not, you know, just practical uh, job skills. Um, and so, with that said, I mean, it, interestingly, like, look, we 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 certainly look at which university someone uh, uh, someone comes from when they apply to to Top Hat. That's an important uh, signal. Um, but like many companies, I mean, we're not we're not requiring university degrees. We've got lots of folks, uh, certainly on the engineering side and, and other roles, uh, uh, where people don't have university degrees. You know, some of our directors and VPs, like senior folks that are doing really well financially, uh, are you know don't have university degrees. Uh, so uh, I, I think that that also poses a challenge, especially as costs have escalated to to ensure that people that. Uh, uh, are able to go to universities that they see that uh, that value that difference between uh, you know just getting a job uh, which can be disintermediated can be uh, you know replaced with lots of other uh, uh, cheaper alternatives uh, and it's seen as a much more kind of personal development uh, component that uh, lasts. Yep, I love it. Uh, okay, so we're going to hand it over to Laura in a second. I will just say it's just inspiring to hear you talk, especially in the world that we live in right now and seeing what's happening. Uh, you know, south of the border with uh, the idea that Canada um, continues to build citizenship with empathy, critical thinking skills, and, uh, and, and create environments of informed discourse, I think creates a real interesting opportunity for us to continue to double down on that type of education. Um, and, and we're very fortunate to, to, be, um, to be in the circumstance that we are in a lot of ways. So, uh, Laura, take us, take us away. We have, this is so inspiring. You said it right, Chris, and we have a lot of questions um, and some of them are being voted up. We're going to start off with Darian Zagante, who has a question about degrees. Um, Darian, we're going to find you and unmute you. Just tell us where you're calling in from and, uh, and who you are before you ask your question. 
Perfect. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so Darian Zagante, I'm calling in from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I work here at Whittington Ventures. We're a new VC fund uh, here, in, here in Canada, started about eight months ago. And so my question is, when it comes to universities, and I know Waterloo has been said a lot, um, most universities, especially when it comes to sciences, uh, engineering, any, really any of the STEM programs, they tend to have a specialty. And I'm wondering if when we're looking at specialties and when we're looking at extracurricular courses or uh, courses that are required to round out a degree, let's say when you're taking a sciences, you need to take a psychology or you need to take an English course. Do you see that universities are going to become further specialized with this whole no one's on campus anymore? And so they can kind of pick and choose what professors they have. They can further specialize. And then ultimately to the point where someone might get a degree via taking courses from multiple universities or colleges. Do you see that as being a trend where we might be going or is, are there legal restrictions behind that or are there other restrictions that you might, uh, might see? Kristen, I wonder if you, uh, if you have a response. Yeah, to that. There's, a, there's a really interesting question. And with the advent of uh, both accredited and non-accredited innovative types of, you know, educators, let's say, or programs, we're seeing things like stackable degrees, we're seeing, seeing things like the great unbundling of higher education is talked about an awful lot. And so the opportunity uh, for students to say, I'm going to, to create my own, um, my own path uh, is there. It's also a challenge, of course, because it's, it's, it's uh, not as organized, but the, there are some really interesting organizations that are working on that. Guild Education is being one of them, um, saying how do you put together a mix of things to get the outcome that you're looking for. Um, I'd love to hear from Brian too on this one because uh, you probably are talking about that within the you know, within institutions to say how do we um, either you know put 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 the puzzle or Lego pieces together differently than we traditionally have. I'm curious what you're seeing if there's pressure to do that. Yeah, I think we will see some of this. I mean, short term, of course, we're not going to see radical changes in curriculum just in the next year. But I think what we are seeing is uh, a, a very rapid emphasis on quality instructional design, um, online course design. We've just launched, we're probably doing triple or quadruple the course design at Queen's Engineering than we usually have. Uh, so long term, I certainly think we will have opportunity. I think um, the first couple of years of education tends to include the fundamentals and that's not radically likely to change. You're still teaching the core physics and mathematics that underlie some of these things. There's certainly opportunity for specialization. Um, and you know, I think there is opportunity for uh, adoption of things like edX. There's micro masters popping up, opportunity for students to take specialized courses, especially third and fourth year that you may not be able to get other institutions. The more those kinds of courses are made online, the more opportunity students have to do some of the specialized programming. Uh, there certainly has been discussion between universities in the past about um, easy transfer. And I would suspect because many of us are developing more online programming, we're going to see that increase in the post COVID era. Awesome. We have, uh, we have so many questions. Thank you both for your answers there. We have um, one from Thierry Liu. Thierry, introduce yourself and ask this question that's on a lot of people's mind. Hi, Laura. Uh, thank you for, to, for, for everyone uh, for uh, attending this, uh, this webinar. Uh, my question, uh, uh, so sorry, my name is Thierry Liu and uh, I'm actually a trade commissioner working for uh, Global Affairs and uh, also the CTA uh, program manager. And my question is, um, I was wondering if would, uh, if would make, uh, if uh, enrolling in a university with a predefined curriculum uh, online would still make sense as opposed to learning from a curriculum that any prof professor can teach uh, on their own. So I, it's, it's a little bit related to, uh, to the question that was previously, previously asked. What is the difference between accredited program versus non-accredited program? Got it. Uh, Thierry, who would you like to answer your question? Oh, we just, we just unmuted him. Um, did, did everyone understand Thierry's question? 
Is that great? Um, do we have uh, any responses for Thierry on that one? I, I mean, I can I can provide one aspect or perspective, though I, maybe I'm not necessarily the best one to answer it. Um, look, uh, in theory, like imagine a world where everyone is totally eternally driven and credentials don't matter, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, this sort of idealized universe. Sure, you can go to YouTube and you know Wikipedia and Khan Academy and just go to the library and just read all this stuff and you can get everything that you can uh, in terms of knowledge, like concrete knowledge uh, that you could get in a university. Um, and so it, I think it's that kind of idealized um, perspective and the perspective that really what you go to university for is the knowledge. That perspective would lead you to think, oh, well, if you're going to university for knowledge, sure, just pick and choose from lots of different professors and, uh, uh, you know, go, just go to five different schools over a period of time and stack it together. Like, yeah, but that's not, that's not why people go to university. Like people, I would say the primary reason, really, if you boil it down, like the primary reason that students go to university is for the on-campus experience. It's for that, or, or I should say, sorry, it's for that community experience. It's to be able to connect with fellow students. They're in the same stage of life. They're in the same uh, program, passionate about the same things. It's to connect with subject matter experts and not connect with them as in watch them, you know, deliver a lecture, but connect with them on a, on a personal level so they can share the passion for the, the material that's being taught. That is a much more um, soft and nuanced thing. Uh, you can't replace that by watching some YouTube videos. You can't replace that by handing someone, you know, a book. Uh, uh, or, or stacking a bunch of uh, you know micro credentials. It's not the same thing. If you're looking for vocational training on how to you know be a plumber or a coder or whatever, cool. Yeah, there's a hundred different ways to to do that. Um, but university is about more than that. It's it's a it's really about how to be a better human in a sense. Uh, so that's why I don't I don't think that this sort of um, some aspects at least of this great unbundling are necessarily going to happen because that's not what university was ever for. Um, it's, it's really almost a life experience that parents want to confer on their children. That, that's really what it's about. Some real uh, truth to what you're saying there, uh, uh, Mike. Let's go over to Shahram Yousefi. Shahram has, uh, first introduce yourself and then um, tell us your question about the publicly funded uh, universities that you'd like to ask the startups in the room on. Thank you, Laura. Can you hear me? Perfectly, yeah. Perfect. Uh, Laura and C100 team, thank you for always being relevant, putting, putting what matters uh, for your stakeholders uh, on your agenda. And this is, this is the perfect combination of education and technology coming together with, you know, Canadian unicorns and uh, some of the best universities. Uh, the question I have, uh, so I am, I'm Associate Dean of Corporate Relations at Queens and uh, uh, the question I have personally over the past 10 years is a philosophical question that relates to what Mike just brought up, what universities are for. You know, with the emergence of Lando schools, very, very, you know, specific, uh, focused uh, educational um, uh, platforms, uh, MOOCs, and, uh, and things of that nature, there's been a lot of activity in ed tech and some disruption there. Uh, I wonder how people on the panel, and this, this question relates to everybody, uh, who can who can shed light on it? How do you see the dance between these two uh, seemingly zero sum competing uh, directions for education going forward? I'd love to dive in on that one. I think that there have been a lot of energy and dollars wasted on some ed tech innovations that haven't worked, uh, but they've all advanced our thinking and there's been learning. Um, the, to me, the change does have to come in collaboration with existing institutions, but this meeting in the middle. So I, I don't know that it's, I think of it as a zero sum game. I think there are, of course, limited dollars, but how can, um, how can funding be redirected um, with uh, the consistent view on what the outcome should be, which is, you know, student learning, student outcomes, you know, and, and those come in the form of uh, a number of things, including the ability to have a good life after university. But it's um, what I love about Apply Board and Top Hat is that they are collaborating with institutions, not fighting against um, e existing efforts. And so when you see Top Hat building with and for faculty, saying, what is the pain that faculty is experiencing today, and how can we 
both lower cost for students because textbooks don't have to be print anymore and um, and also provide a better you know supportive experience for the faculty as well as the student like to me that's a win-win-win and so looking for those win-wins is where I get excited but this is my perspective any reactions to that? Uh, um, a little bit to it too we also have to see how this dance between like completely a different experience is also related to how the assessment um, assessment technologies and assessment industry grow. We rely on universities today to do some assessment. Are you guys comfortable going on a bridge that someone just made it and not a PN and no assessment was done? Are you guys okay that someone who just learned on, online from different courses to do, to do your surgery? No, we all know that there are certain assessment has to be done because it's factoring our life. The ring that we have in our, our hand as engineers in Canada is because a bridge collapsed and people died. That's why we do this. And this is the irony of we get together and this is a certain standard. So if I need to go and build a bridge, we need to like have that. So it's not only about whether the online gonna take over, that's another industry have to be built right beside it is, okay, how is the assessment gonna be in place? Or the society then accept X, Y, Z, I call it top hat plus assessment for civil engineering. If the society and the cities are accepting that as a new PN and a new STEM, so they can approve the bridge and that bridge that people's safety gonna go on it. Um, yes, for business, for even for data science, for computers, a lot of them this happen, but we have to also see, like you want your psychiatric to be some standard. You want the person who is doing your pharmacies to have some standard. And is it, or is only always on the consumer to choose that, right? I think the society needs some, as we need law, we need also some assessment until that assessment is so integrated with our higher education degrees that massive dis destruction of oh, all of a sudden universities go it goes away so that's why i think the best ed tech companies would come the guys that work with universities hand to hand because building that credit for the entire country that png is no longer matter it takes way longer than making adaptable mechanical engineering in, uni in the current universities. Yeah, I think that's such a great point, uh, Martin, uh, uh, that, that the partnership between universities and technology companies is, is so critical. Uh, and I'll, uh, I, mean, I'll, I wanna say something somewhat controversial and uh, uh, you know, push on Canadian universities a little bit. Um, I, we certainly as Top Hat have noticed that one of the challenges we find in, in higher education uh, institutions, particularly at the administration uh, level, and I will say that this is especially true in Canada, actually much more so than, than in the US, is that while faculty are embracing of technology, embracing of tools to, to help them, I mean, they need the help. They're, they're being overloaded with a huge amount of work. Uh, they're being, you know, they're being asked to teach more and more, the, to use fewer TAs, to teach larger courses. Uh, and so they are out there, they're looking for tools, they're looking for ways of, of easing that, uh, that burden. Uh, universities, on the other hand, at the administrative level, often see technology companies as, you know, they, they put it into this bucket as academia and vendors. And if you're a vendor, like, oh, well, like, we don't really want to partner with you. We don't really like, want to talk to you about what the, the solution might look like. Um, and I think that bifurcation, I mean, it doesn't exist in industry. It doesn't exist in any other uh, space uh, out there uh, because the, the providers that are making tools are necessarily want to be partners with their customers. Whereas in university, there's this kind of business versus public dynamic uh, that if you're a business, you know, that, that, it's, that those conversations are not uh, embraced. And I think that's one of the ways that I think universities can meet the challenge uh, of this coming fall of this this crisis that's upon us is by partnering with technology companies and working with them to find solutions uh, uh, to this issue because we've seen universities resistant to that uh, 
uh, and looking much more uh, internally uh, to where, you know, frankly, universities don't have skill sets around building software and technology. Uh, they should be partnering with, uh, with businesses whose, uh, whose primary focus is around that. I just want to chime in and say every ed tech entrepreneur I've ever met is mission driven. They've made a business model choice to be most efficient. Sometimes it's venture back, but every single person that chooses to start a company in education technology is mission driven. It is mm -hmm. very hard. There are easier right. ways. And so it's not because they see this opportunity to become rich and make money. Most of us, you know, are, are, are doing fighting the hard fight. So it's a good way to think about trusting. I think universities can trust that these people have started these companies to make a difference. I think oh, you're right. Wait. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Laura. Go ahead, Brian. I would love to hear you respond to that the mindset shift that, that Mike's talking about. We do have one more question to get to uh, before okay. we wrap up after, after your comment. So very briefly, I think we are seeing more of that. Uh, there's been discussions in the past few weeks about um, working with vendors to provide solutions for doing blended and online delivery. Um, we're working, trying to work very rapidly. You know, complexity, especially universities, of course, is the significant autonomy because instructors have very particular expertise uh, and making a decision coherently to go and adopt one particular approach is quite challenging. Um, that said, they're always innovators. I was using Top Hat, I think, probably 10 years ago, back when the, the oh, wow. early days. Yep. So, you know, <laughs> it was one of those things that we certainly do have people who are innovating. And so, of course, you see pockets of this, but I agree that we're probably going to see more of this as people start exploring ed tech in the coming year. Well, um, awesome. So completely different question for you all. And it is, however, about this dynamic between Canada and the United States. We're going to go to Heather Christie Burns. Heather, you have a really interesting question. I think we should first direct it to Martin, given what his focus is. Great, thank you very much, Laura. Thanks for this incredibly timely event. Um, I have board meetings, hours of them on Zoom over the next two weeks. So what I'm curious about, and this is really that uh, difference with the Canadian and the US schools, what we're looking at, a lot of focus on cost per degree. I'm at the University of Calgary and we went through a tuition increase uh, because of provincial budget cuts that happened last fall and now we're in COVID. So the pressures are really high, but even with the tuition increases, just looking at the cost of things like even an engineering degree uh, with, with a great uh, faculty behind it, it is very low when you look at uh, this is four or five or more times in the US. So one of the things I'm wondering is if we're free from the physical campus in some ways, how can we potentially attract students from the US who to your point, the danger in some of the, the, the not big institutions, the ones that are the smaller uh, universities, no one's going to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars dollars per year to gain a degree on Zoom. So I know there's issues, barriers with this. Um, what does the panel think on, on these topics? Yeah, I think the, not only for, for the US market, but also from other markets, um, Canada in particular have a great asset to turn uh, international education as a bigger export as it is today. Is right now after automotive and natural resources our third biggest export, but I can see that even grow more. So uh, it's it's a huge it's a huge opportunity for all these schools to get these scholars. And it's not only about the money. Think about you can select better people globally so you can have better a student body so you could be more selective if you can do so and this is an opportunity that we are fighting for it it at a fiber to enable all of our universities and colleges to not only like do that money piece that uh, it was mentioned but also select the most diverse and best quality students to their classes I want to dive in and say I grew up hearing about the brain drain, you know, from in, growing up in Quebec, the brain drain to the south. And I think that there is an incredible opportunity to reverse the brain drain. And I think it's happening um, from an affordability standpoint for college, from a quality point of view for, from universities in Canada, and from an opportunity standpoint in, in the economy. So uh, both recruiting international students and Americans to come and study in Canada, but also talent that has been 
working in tech for a really long time and has those reps and those experiences to come and work in Canada for incredible companies like Apply Board and Top Hat, um, it's, it's this opportunity for Canada to start saying, wait, like we can reverse that. Yeah, I think this is absolutely the opportunity for Canada to shine and to differentiate. I mean, I think this fall, uh, you know, to go back to what I, I said at the very beginning, there's going to be a bifurcation. There's going to be schools that absolutely nail it, that figure out active learning, that differentiate themselves from the Lambda schools and, you know, other low cost uh, online alternatives. And then there's the schools that will, as I said, hand their props to Zoom license and hope for the best. Uh, uh, this is the opportunity for Top Hat to let, uh, sorry, for <laughs> for universities, uh, also for Top Hat and universities. Um, uh, but this is the opportunity for schools to differentiate, to leverage the fact that Canada has uh, an awesome immigration system that actually welcomes people from other countries, unlike, uh, you know, folks down south. Um, um, and, uh, and bring that talent in and create a really differentiated experience uh, that will hopefully help them uh, stick around. And also Canada is such a good place to, to be there and to raise family and like toward day by day, we can see how Canadians are becoming more compassionate and a better society. And I'm very proud of that. What a nice way to end. We are at time. Uh, and so I want to just thank the four of you again, Kristen, Mike, Martin, Brian, thank you so much. Um, to the rest of you, thank you so much for being part of this discussion today. Um, really hope that you all consider getting involved um, more deeply, if you, especially if you are um, local to the Bay Area. Uh, 